Welcome, friends, to day two of RPG A Day 2020. I am Omnisai, here with you once more, and today we are going to be talking about my game, Dice File, and how it's changing, growing, and adapting, as we will do throughout this month. That is the aspect of positivity that I want to focus on for 2020, the birth of a new game, or as close as we can get by the time the month is out. A lot of time since 2014, when I first conceptualized uh, the initial elements of Dice File, uh, a lot of time has changed, and I haven't spent every waking moment working on it. This is a passion project, but the passion smolders from time to time. It's never been completely gone, but I have been dispirited from time to time when I've seen other similar systems that I have learned exist that are similar, and that sometimes strikes a blow. For instance, when I encounter the mechanics for Savage World, uh, finding out that they use a similar dice value system for their attributes and skills, similar to mine. Um, that was kind of a little bit of a blow, but honestly, uh, my system is still more than different enough than anything I've seen that it can stand on its own. So, today the topic is change. And quite honestly, change in my mind is good. It fits along with evolution. An idea that comes out rarely is perfect out of the gates. Uh, and if you have been developing your idea and it hasn't changed since you first conceptualized it, it means one of two things. It could be that it's very, 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 very simple to the point there's really nothing left to add or take away, which I, is possible, certainly. But if you're talking about something like a system of mechanics for a game, um, it possibly means that you haven't been critical enough and really taken a good long look at its strengths and weaknesses to figure out, you know, what exactly works and what doesn't. Now, in my case, with my dice file game, I've had a number of years and then I've taken a rest and come back and looked at it and saw the changes that I made and saw the system as it is. And in a couple of cases, I stopped and went, no, that's just not going to work. Something about this just doesn't feel right. Now, a lot of times, for instance, I have been comfortable with saying, all right, if I have a character who has, for instance, an eight-sided die in skill, okay, and he is taking on a person who has a six-sided die in skill, statistically, the person with the eight-sided die in skill should have an advantage, but not an overwhelming advantage to the point that that person will always win. True, they have a 1 in 4 chance of having a number so high that it can't compare against the person with the 6-sided die in skill. Yes, that's true. But they also have a chance of rolling a 1 or a 2, which will almost always be beaten by the person rolling the 6-sided die. And that, to me, seemed fair and equitable. But then it also occurred to me that there's a number of systems and mechanics that I've seen in other games that I kind of wanted to bring along. For example, the idea of an all-out attack giving you a bonus if you're willing to really commit to it. And since I already have characters who have dice pools, basically a, a, a pool of dice that you take your dice that you're going to do things with out of your dice pool, roll those, and those dice are not returned to replenish into the pool until the, the exchange is over and everybody's had a chance to do something. So, my, in my mind, it was just, I'm going to do something, so I take one of the dice out of my dice pool and roll it, and somebody else can roll. And after a while, I started realizing, what if somebody really wants a better chance of success? It's still not going to guarantee anything, but what happens if they would, say, could take another die out of the pool, roll it as well? And I started to think about, well, okay, now that we're adding extra dice... Um, what would be the, the situation of, of having gear along with you? In Dungeons & Dragons, if you have a weapon, for instance, and you hit somebody with it, then you roll a separate die roll for the weapon. The bigger the weapon, the more damage it does, typically. And then you just add on various things based on your skills, based on how strong you are or quick you are, you know, what have you. I didn't really want to do that, because for me it's always been a disconnect. For everything you do in Dungeons & Dragons, you roll a 20-sided die, and you add a number, unless it's damage. 
then you roll a completely different die. Why? Because that's the way Dungeons and Dragons has always been, ever since, well, first edition, uh, or with the more advanced rules from uh, zero edition, the white box set and such. So, honestly, that's the purity of purpose in a system, I think, is very useful. Having the same mechanic over and over again to resolve everything, I think, makes for a simpler system, easier to learn, easier to understand, and the less different instances you have. Okay, now here you're going to roll percentile dice. Here you're going to roll a 20-sided die. And here you're going to convert this to this and can... That would be palladium, by the way. Um, it, it doesn't work as well. There's a lot of stop and start to it and consulting tables and... I n always had a little bit of an issue with it, but more now that I've seen how a more simple purpose and a uh, more streamlined system is just easier to run and easier to learn. I wanted my system to be very similar to that, something that is simple and uses the same mechanic over and over and over again. So this is what I came up with. When you try to do something, like say you have two warriors who are fighting, the warriors will take turns doing exchanges, because I don't have a problem with that. For every effort, uh, you can have a react reaction to that. So for instance, if you've got two warriors with uh, a sword and shield, and they're wearing armor. All right, so the warrior who is on the attack, the one who is first, and I have mechanics for initiative in this, uh, the one who is first will attack. He will look at his dice pool, and he will decide up to the level of his skill with the sword, what die he's going to select. He doesn't have to use the most powerful one. He can use a lesser one and draw his opponent out with a feint, just flicking an attack out to see if the opponent will block and use one of their stronger defensive dice to open up for a more powerful blow later. That's trusting to your armor and your defensive skills to keep you in the fight. So that's something that's a valid ability and it doesn't need its own separate mechanic. You make that decision when you choose how much effort to put into your skill. Kind of cool, isn't it? I think it is. So they'll take their skill. Then they'll take another die based on their ability. It cannot be greater than the level of the skill, however. So if they have a muscle, for instance, of a D8 and a sword skill of a D6, they can use two six-sided dice out of their pool, one for their muscle and one for their skill, and roll both of them at the same time. But they're also using a sword. The sword has a die value as well. So if it is a dueling sword, for instance, it might be a six-sided die as well. So you might be rolling three six-sided dice for just a, a common stroke. This will be a solid attempt to hit your opponent because you're not using a four-sided die, which would be a lesser die value. You are taking the fact that you are fairly strong and the fact that you are, um, you are using a decent weapon to take a shot at trying to crack through your foe's armor. Now say your foe has a shield, and say they have a six-sided die in value in, in, in their shield defense skill. Say they also have a, what was it, finesse, which is your, your dexterity, basically, of a d8, we'll say, match up against the, the stronger muscle of the other fighter. So since your shield defense is a d6, you can only go up to a d6 level of skill in your, uh, or level of your finesse, so you can roll two six-sided dice, and say your shield, uh, a standard kite shield, would give you a d6 as well. So you are also rolling three six-sided dice. Now interestingly enough, the gear dice is going to be separate from the dice you've pulled out of your dice pool because every time you use your gear die, you're going to roll that die again, so it's not exhausted. It's returned back to the gear dice pool. So, both roll three six-sided dice. So you're going to generate a number between 3 and 18, right? Not exactly. You're looking for the highest die value out of those three dice. Essentially, your stroke is never going to be higher than the value of the biggest die that you're going to get, but the other dice are there to add a little extra insurance, basically. So, for instance, if you're, uh, say, you're swinging with your sword and your cut is clumsy, and 
your sword doesn't do you any favors. You hit with the flat of the blade, but you're really strong. That muscle die may be the highest value, and then you're going to hurt them because you hit them with a hard blow. On the other hand, if, say, you aim a fairly weak shot and a fairly clumsy shot, but your sword was lined perfectly up, great edge alignment, uh, to possibly open up a devastating cut, that would be your gear die being the high value and doing well for that. So you want to roll as many dice as possible to give you the best chance of success, and also keep away from rolling all ones, which is a fumble. <laughs> so, uh, And also, too, many of those uh, dice that I was just talking about may be completely optional. You always have to roll the skill die when you try to do something, but you don't necessarily have to apply your uh, physical abilities. So if you just want to faint and you take your four-sided die and your six-sided die for your sword and roll that as an attack, you can. You didn't put a lot of skill and effort into it and you didn't pack a lot of muscle behind it. You just basically whipped out your weapon as a threat the, other po the opponent hopefully will honor as a full attack. And sometimes you might even get lucky and open up a blow on them. You have the potential to, which is why you're throwing your dangerous sword at them in the first place. But to see how the mechanics all kind of work together, the more of these dice that you roll and the higher value dice that you roll gives you a chance of success, even if you're not trying very hard, even if you're not particularly apt, you can cover yourself with all these different things. Another way of looking at it for me as a person who is absolutely a master with a knife, beautiful dirksmanship skill, say a, ten, a, a D10 level in skill, using a dirk, which is a smaller weapon, only provides a D4. It's relatively more difficult to kill a person with a dagger than it is for many of the other weapons, but certainly not impossible. If the other person is a complete lout, has a, uh, a great sword, big, heavy weapon. If it hits, it does a D10 damage. It has the potential for opening up grievous wounds. But the person's never picked one up before, so he's only rolling a four-sided die in skill. They're in a pretty good match, actually. It then comes down to whether or not the person with the dagger can get in, and if he can, he can have a pretty good chance of killing the other person. But that clumsy guy may not land a blow too often, but if he does... It could really take. It could end the fight in a single blow. They're roughly equivalent because they're both rolling a ten-sided die and a four-sided die in their attempt to do something to each other. It's just that the person with the dirksmanship has a different range of different abilities that they can use, so that they could say again, faint, and with a relatively weak die, try to get in an attack. And if that's the case, if they can score with that faint and maybe do a little damage then they can apply another die in the same exchange and they can attack maybe twice and have a chance of uh, inflicting a couple of wounds. Whereas the person who is a clod doesn't have that luxury, so all they can do is take their one or two big shots. So that's kind of the finesse behind the, the game. And that's an evolution. That came out of playtesting and that came out of further just thinking about weaknesses that I thought my game had and figuring out how can I use this basic mechanic and work around these problems that I'm foreseeing. Things that are dead spots in the game that take away from the dynamic choice that players will have in how they play this game. So, realistically, without change in one way, shape, or form, games are effectively doomed. They're doomed to get no better than what they were when they were first conceptualized. They have to evolve. And that's why when I see one person putting out a game, sometimes I can be a little bit leery because maybe they got advice from other people, but maybe not. Maybe they just threw out an idea and maybe it could have used some refinement of other voices. Sometimes not. Single people can come up with brilliant ideas. But still, I'm just saying that uh, games often should change from experience. That's why playtesting is so important for a game. As well as allowing yourself to develop and percolate thoughts as you go. That's why, honestly, additions oftentimes lead to stronger games overall by weeding out the extraneous and concentrating on the core elements of, of games. Sometimes games will drift from their original purpose in such a way that the original fans can't connect with the game anymore. That does happen. But oftentimes, when you see a game that makes fundamental changes to their system, 
it's used for purposes of strengthening the game and making it better in, in at least some ways. Sometimes it means saying goodbye to things that they don't value as much, but oftentimes it means having a clear, more defined game and improving upon the product in such a way that makes it more pleasing to the eye and um, more marketable, for lack of a better word. So that's my thoughts on change and some expression on how my game has changed over time. Please join me tomorrow and we'll talk about the next topic that the RPG A Day throws at us, which is thread. The mind boggles. Thank you for joining me. I'm Omnisai, and I look forward to seeing you next time here for RPG A Day 2020. Farewell.